The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. I basically, the, the, I titled this topic or this talk rather, Discovering Your Coin, because uh, what I've found in my conversations with a lot of collectors is they buy these, they buy pieces for their collection, um, but they really uh, sometimes don't know uh, anything uh, uh, beyond the tip of the iceberg about about that piece. And there's so much more to learn. And it's such a fascinating aspect of the hobby, learning about these pieces and kind of that more scholarly side of things. Um, I always try and encourage them to do that deeper research. And that's what I'm hoping to help you guys with here today as well. So here's how to truly learn about the objects you're collecting, at least in my opinion, and from what I've learned in the past. So really, the, the first thing to realize is that they're not just objects. And basically, all of you guys, I hope, know this already, is that coins are, are more than just uh, objects. They're When you add a new coin or token or metal or banknotes to your collection, you're not just adding like a hunk of metal or a piece of paper. There's so much more to it. Um, otherwise, I don't think many of us would be collecting, to be honest with you. There's a lot of broad context to this piece that you have in your collection, right? Um, it, it, beyond what you're holding in front of you here, this coin, uh, one of the things I hear most from non-collectors um, is when I show them some old uh, old piece from my collection, they'll be like, wow, imagine how many hands that's been through. And as a collector who's been doing this for uh, like eight years at this point, a little bit of that wonder of, wow, how many coins is it, or hands has this been through has has kind of gone from me, but I'm still uh, I'm still blown away by how many non-collectors just are, are blown away by the history of this piece. And so that's an important thing to recognize is it's not just in the here and now, this piece has been going for however many years since it's been made, whether that be uh, 10 or or 1,000. And the, the context um, of, of the piece is, in my opinion, one of the most important things in order to have this full appreciation of your collection. Understanding how it got to you and what it's all about is so much more than just filling those spots in the Whitman folder or putting it in two by twos or putting slabs in a slab box. Really understanding the full context is really key. And appreciation of these pieces makes it more fun for you uh, in terms of understanding how just cool your collection definitely is. Uh, it makes me at least more passionate about the hobby, um, knowing that there's there's a lot more to it. It also builds community. Um, and I'll get into more of that a little bit, but but really connecting with other people who share these similar interests and who can either you can either tell these stories to or who can tell you these stories and give you this information about these objects in your collection really build quite a sense of community. I collect some pretty niche things myself and other collectors I've found who share these niche passions within numismatics really have formed a tight bond together. And that's a great part. It also makes me more passionate. And it also just makes a stronger hobby as a whole. When collectors are educated and they're making advancements in the hobby, not only for themselves, but hopefully you also choose to share the information that you learned and share your collection and exhibiting or whatever else it might be, that just makes a, a hobby stronger. And, and that's really important. So this appreciation of the context of these pieces is not just a kind of a, a random project, but really a quite an essential part of, of numismatics. So let's talk about the methodology for learning about coins. Um, when, you, when you look at a numismatic object, so that can be a coin or a paper money or a token or metal, up to you. Here's the questions I ask myself, and you all have likely heard this before. It's who, what, where, when, why, and how. And so uh, most of you probably are familiar with this from like Sherlock Holmes or whatever else it might be. But these questions really do get to that foundational um, uh, part of, of your object and figuring out um, kind of approaches to learning about it. And so I'll, I'll dive into each one of those questions here. Um, but, but that's kind of the thing that I, I first um, go through as a, almost a checklist when I first have a coin. So let's start with who. There's basically two questions about who that you should be asking yourself anytime you purchase a new piece or have a piece that after this talk you want to go back and look at. First one is who owned this? Who owned this before me? Unless it's like a very, very uh, rare or sorry, very, very new uh, piece, maybe like you buy it directly from the mint or whatever else it might be, it's pretty likely that someone before owned, you, uh, owned it. And, and that can provide some really interesting context to the piece and have some really cool stories. Similarly, uh, now the other question is who collects this? Not only should you be looking at who used to own this piece, but who collects similar things to what I just purchased? Uh, if I purchased a, uh, let's say a Morgan dollar uh, for, for, for just a, a general example, um, who else right now is collecting Morgan dollars? The answer is going to be a lot of people. By understanding who else is collecting this will not only allow you to meet like-minded people uh, who can teach you more, but it'll also allow you to um, 
maybe buy more Morgan dollars. It'll allow you to kind of, again, build that sense of community, meet people with similar passions, similar interests, um, and really connect with people in a whole new way. Um, so finding out who collects this as well is, is another who question you want to ask. In terms of that first who question, who owned this, the ability to determine the provenance of a coin is kind of dependent on, on where um, that piece was acquired. If you're buying it from an auction company um, and it's a, it's a more expensive coin, you're probably gonna be able to find out the provenance. Usually um, in the lot catalog descriptions, they will mention who has previously owned this. Um, if you're buying it from a dealer, it's, it's kind of hit or miss. Um, you, might, you might get it, but you might not, um, but you can definitely ask. Um, and they might tell you they might not, but it's worth asking. Um, if you buy it from a private collection, again, you can probably get some insights going a little far back. So every piece is going to be different. But uh, uh, I actually met a, a guy once, um, a, a lot of books, uh, especially in the early 20th century and mid 20th century about numismatics use plates, right? Auction catalogs as well. They'd use like lithographic plates for pictures of coins. And sometimes people will come across, um, they'll, they'll be owning a coin and they'll be reading through the book and looking at the plates of these coins. And they realize, hey, my coin's actually on this plate. And that kind of helps the provenance as well because they know the author probably owned this coin at some point or at least had access to someone who did. So it's always kind of something fun you can stumble across in research. And finding current similar collectors um, can really be achieved uh, a, a couple different ways. And this is getting at that second who question. Um, there's a, most uh, numismatic niches have um, a specialist organization that caters to their need. If you're into numismatic literature, there's an organization for you. If you're into Morgan Dollars, there's an organization for you. If you're into trade tokens, same thing. So no matter what you're really into, um, there is, there's an option. Paper money to the extreme. There's tons of organizations. There's really no limits. And so uh, if you really reach out to these organizations and most of them have a website or a presence that shows, um, you can really connect not only with coll individual collectors who have a lot of resources for you, um, but also become part of this greater organization that's contributing um, to numismatics uh, in a really great way. Also, honestly, the internet's fantastic uh, for finding other collectors. There's a lot of um, uh, pre collector presence on social media, which is a great way to find uh, like-minded interests. Um, there's forums hosted by PCGS, and I know NGC has some as well, where you can meet like-minded individuals. Um, the internet's a really good way to meet people, and, and it's a whole new way as well. Also, you can just ask. If you're at a show um, and you buy a coin from a dealer, or you buy, let's say, a, a medal from a dealer, and you say, hey, like medals just fascinate me. Where can I learn more? Usually if that dealer is selling metals, they'll be able to point you in the direction of some other dealers, some organizations, or some other collectors like yourself who can actually really get, um, get you more information. And again, um, introduce you to people who are, are really quite fascinated by that subject. Um, most, most, uh, most hobbyists are really inclined to help you find people um, who, who share the same interests you do. And here's a little example of from a uh, heritage auctions, actually, um, of a lot description in terms of the provenance like we were just discussing. This is from a coin that was actually just auctioned off a couple days ago. Um, and it, it was a pretty rare piece. And so you can see they detail out the provenance pretty deeply. But you can see all the way back to 1882 where this coin was and what auctions it was sold in, which kind of gives you an idea of which collections it's been in. And it's been in some pretty famous collections. Um, so auction companies, uh, Heritage and Stacks Bowers both have great archives online to really reference and understand uh, where your coin might have come from. Really key. Let's talk about the what. So every numismatic object has a story. And I've, I've given talks about these stories before, so I'm not going to go into a whole thing. You guys can find those um, elsewhere online. But the stories are really what's fascinating to me. Um, and in my experience, talking with non-collectors was fascinating to them. Uh, sometimes I'll go into schools or, or my own school, even I'll bring like a racketeer nickel, nothing super expensive. People are fascinated by racketeer nickels and the, these, these kind of fun stories uh, behind objects that that uh, have a true history of them are, are really um, quite engaging. Um, and so what, when, you're, when you're looking at your own personal numismatic object and you're trying to get this what, your job or rather your, your fun assignment is to find out what that story behind its creation is. And, uh, and you can kind of take out who, what, where, when, why, how approach as well uh, as done by that little bit of a, a acronym there. Not a great acronym, but uh, an acronym nonetheless. Um, and really finding out the story behind this creation. Like, um, what, what, what is the reason for this existence, right? Um, and, and usually there's some pretty fascinating uh, reasoning behind each and every piece. And the process of discovering that story behind these, these pieces is one that countless numismatists have really fallen in love with. Not only finding out, but that research process is really a big draw for a lot of collectors. And if you try really doing this in-depth research on your pieces, 
uh, I would I would put good money on the fact that you uh, will probably in enjoy that process. A lot of uh, people end up enjoying it enough that they decide to share their research and either publish it or give talks on it uh, or just share it individually with other collectors who who share, again, similar interests that they do. Um, and, and is really what draws new collectors in. So um, this what is actually a really essential part of finding out about your coin. What is the story behind it? What, 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 were, the, what were the key events that led to this coin's creation? And to learn the story of, of your coin, uh, to learn that what, there's a couple different resources you can consult and they include, but they're most definitely not limited to um, the Newman Numismatic Portal. It's a great uh, resource. It's an aggregator of content, whether that be books, uh, periodicals, um, like uh, biographies, um, documents, photos, everything you can imagine has, I, I think, millions of objects um, of digitized, completely free numismatic information. It is truly one of the best resources I've ever seen for numismatics. I almost guarantee that any piece you're looking at, unless it's the most obscure thing ever, and even some of the most obscure things ever, is going to be on the Newman Numismatic Portal. So simply uh, using that platform, I highly recommend. Um, and that's a great thing for finding out the story behind your coin. Maybe you'll find an article from 1968 about about a, a, a banknote that you have in your collection. And, and that really gives context that you couldn't find anywhere else. Physical publications are great, too. You don't just have to stick to digitized things. Uh, books and magazines are are well, um, are, are, are great resources of, uh, sources of information. They tend to be very thoroughly researched. The ANA has a lending library. If you're an ANA member, uh, it's, it only costs you postage to borrow these books. Um, similarly, if you want to purchase a books or periodicals or wherever else it might be, um, there's numismatic booksellers who can point you in the right direction or say, hey, have you thought of this reference? And they can acquire that piece for you. Um, or whether that be a snipping from a numismatic scrapbook in 1943 uh, to a modern day Whitman book. They can help you track that down. So physical publications are great as well. And then there's other websites. I previously mentioned Heritage Auctions and, and Stax Bowers. They have a great um, archives on there. Uh, forums uh, are a great place not only to learn about information that's already been posted, but you can even send an inquiry and you say, hey, I have this piece. Here's a photo. Can anyone tell me about this? Chances are someone can. Social media is great. Facebook, uh, especially for identifying things. Instagram has a lot of collectors on there, tens of thousands, uh, many of whom are passionate young collectors who know how to use the internet to find information um, about your object. So inevitably that's a great resource as well. There's also a lot of other scholarly sites, uh, the Numismatic, uh, uh, the American Numismatic Society Association and other various specialty sites um, really have decent resources um, that can help you find, uh, find the information you're looking for. So um, it might just be a matter of typing your, uh, your piece into a search engine uh, and, and really finding the results that follow. It's also good. Oh, and here's a little picture of the Newman uh, Portal logo at the top there. So let's get into the where and the when. Part of building a broader context around this numismatic object, right, getting this appreciation for it, is the understanding of the world into which your object was created, right? Uh, your object wasn't created in a vacuum. There was things happening in the country um, and or company um, that created the object. Um, and so uh, it's important to have that, that context, even beyond uh, how this coin was struck, but what was going on in the world at the time, right? Um, that heavily influences not only um, having that broader historical knowledge, which is just kind of fun on its own, but also having a true understanding of your object, not only from a scholarly perspective um, and just a genuine interest perspective, but also from a market-oriented perspective. If you're trying to buy or sell a coin, it's really good to know that that uh, in in so and so state at so and so time, um, this coin is going to be like generally coins are going to be more weakly struck because there was some kind of war going on, um, and and so it's it's uh, as you approach buying a coin, you're knowing that most of them are going to be more weakly struck because there's a war. Happening. Happening. So having some context on the environment, having some context on uh, how, how uh, current events were progressing uh, in, let's say, 1864, um, really uh, is, is helpful for you, not only out of knowledge and appreciation, but also as a buyer and a seller. And most of this, most of this information is really available for free. Um, on the web, uh, or uh, actually a, a great place is your local library. The, this broader historical context does not have to come from numismatic literature. It can just come from broad history books and magazines. There's, there's, it's really a quite easily uh, accessible information and quite fasting information. Um, so it's quick and free to really access. You can get it uh, locally, but it will pay dividends in your collection building efforts. It will really help you um, become a better collector overall, understanding the context of the world into which this coin was created. How about the why? 
So now that you know the context behind the coin's creation from the what, you know, the stories, and you know the context of the world at the time from the what and the where, now it's worth examining the object itself. Um, look at look at this piece. Let's say, for example, uh, it is a, a double eagle that's just off the top of my head. Let's look at the exact coin itself. This is one of the quotes that's always stuck with me. Um, a very famous collector said this in the, in the late 20th century. He said, why this design with these devices and, uh, and inscriptions in this denomination, in this metal, at this weight, at this time, and not others? This is kind of a, a, a very multifaceted why question, but it's an important one. And it kind of ties a little bit into the when and the where. A lot of the reasons that your coin is going to be the way that it is um, is because of what was going on in the world at the time. Uh, U.S. coin collectors will know that some of the uh, silver coins has been debased over the years, and that has to do with external factors. It wasn't numismatists usually pushing for this. It was uh, economic forces, etc. cetera. Um, so why this design, right? Why are we seeing Lady Liberty on this coin? Well, that's a really good question. There's actually a lot of really fascinating answers to it um, that are important to know. Uh, why these devices and, and inscriptions, like, right, in God We Trust, very famous in U.S. coins, why is that there? Um, and, and what are the impl uh, implications and ramifications of having that uh, motto on our coinage? And this denomination, right? Um, why don't we still have 20 cent coins in the U.S.? Good question. It's something you should probably research. Um, in this metal, why is it 90% silver or 70% silver or pewter or copper uh, or a copper nickel clad? Why is it that way? Again, you're going to find answers and you're going to be uh, probably find a, uh, yourself in a bit of a rabbit hole as you explore these whys at this weight, especially. Um, uh, and at this time, uh, why, which is also super key. And then, of course, not others. So why is really quite an essential thing. Let's talk about how. Obviously, the Internet um, is a really great resource. Um, uh, as we kind of discussed with Numismatic Portal already, very fantastic. As of social media and forums and auction websites, um, specialty organizations like I previously mentioned, and also miscellaneous scholarly websites. I'd like to share with you all, actually really briefly speaking, of auction websites, um, the Heritage Auctions website, which um, actually uh, I, I pulled up an example from one of their recent auctions. Uh, and you kind of get an insight into really what this, the who, what, where, when, why, and how is, right? So this was one that sold yesterday, actually. Um, it was from um, uh, Columbia University, before it was Columbia University. Uh, it was a literary prize medal. And I was down in Dallas recently, and I got a chance to hold this one um, and take a look at it just before it was sold. Um, and, and as you go into the lot description, you get quite a bit of context. Many of you have likely not seen this metal before, um, but you can, but using uh, the resources that Heritage Auctions makes avail available for free um, in perpetuity, you're able to really get um, insight into this metal, right? Uh, there's only three in existence and one in private hands, kind of gives you some context um, on it. And the context continues actually for quite a while. This is a, a fairly expensive coin. So uh, obviously they're gonna put a little bit more work into describing this than maybe any typical coin a typical collector buys. Um, but really it gives you all this insight of who, what, where, when, why, and how. And speaking of who, here's a little bit of your providence for you. So really, there's a lot of really good resources. And I, what, what I'll share real quick with you also is the Numen numismatic portal. Hopefully this pops up on your screen right here. This is the homepage. Uh, it was uh, founded by Eric P. Newman, who's a very famous collector uh, who passed away a few years ago, um, but this continues to live on. It's a great uh, resource based out of the Washington University in St. Louis, and you can see they're constantly updating things. They have image collections, auction catalogs going back for uh, decades and centuries even. Um, and even if you're looking for, again, that who, you have people on the left-hand side here, there are tons and tons of resources. If you look at the bottom, there's 42,000 books, 10,000 auction lots, 5,000 people, and 25,000 encyclopedia records. So really, this is a beyond fantastic website. Let's get back into the how. So you have the internet, but you also have in-person tangible sources of information, right? Um, coin shows, coin conventions are, have been for me, one of the best sources of information. Um, uh, not only from the individual collectors, uh, but also from the dealers who are there, uh, who have a generally wealth of knowledge, especially in uh, some specialty areas. Uh, token dealers, you'll find know way too much about their, about their subject. Um, but uh, their shows are a really great resource um, for finding people, for finding your community. And, and I really have for a lot of my niche areas as well. Um, as previously mentioned, books and periodicals from the a, &A Library are super, super um, helpful 
um, and and very inexpensive. Um, and they have some really rare pieces that have great information that haven't been digitized yet, and that will really help you in understanding your pieces. Books and periodicals from elsewhere, like I said, you can uh, purchase them yourself or borrow your, them yourself from elsewhere. Um, and numismatic booksellers like uh, Colby and Fanning are a really great resource. Um, uh, and and uh, as are from um, a bunch of other places as well. If you're a member of the American Numismatic Society, you have access to their resources. A lot of the specialty clubs have resources. Um, if you're a member of these clubs, they often issue periodicals. So those of you who are members of clubs like the Early American Copper Society uh, and the Numismatic Bibliomania Society uh, will get uh, quarterly uh, periodicals uh, with great original research. And that can really help you gain not only an appreciation for the piece you have in your hands, but also for the broader series or the broader niche as a whole. And again, your local library. As you're building this local context or this broader context of the world, local library is a great uh, access point, as is, honestly, the internet. But when in doubt, really, just ask another numismatist. Uh, if you haven't really got a chance to uh, interact in person with a numismatist, as most of us haven't due to COVID, but uh, if, you, if you hadn't before that, um, really take advantage as quickly as you can uh, to, to create an interaction, whether that be in person or online. Uh, if you, if you uh, ideally in person though. Um, so if you get a chance after COVID to go to a show or come to summer seminar for the ANA, that is really gonna further uh, your appreciation for, for the hobby. Um, and I, I really do recommend that. Uh, if you're going the online route, um, I, you could start in the forums. Uh, that's a great place to kind of start having discussions with the collectors and sharing your knowledge and hearing from them. But also social media is a great place. And uh, if you have interest in pursuing uh, kind of a social media aspect, there's lots of resources available for new businesses to get involved um, that a lot of honestly young collectors have created uh, so that you can actually uh, so you can actually uh, get uh, um, more knowledgeable about uh, getting started online. Uh, but with that said, that's main, the main bulk of the presentation here. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's, it's um, intentionally short because uh, it really is not that much of a complex process. Uh, you just go through that who, what, where, when, why, how, uh, and I, I, you'll, it'll be basically enough for you. Um, you can kind of take that rabbit hole as far as you, down, as you want. Um, I've spent two minutes researching a piece and I spent days researching a piece. So it's really up to you, um, up to the piece and kind of how you want to approach that. Either way is beyond rewarding. That's about all I'll say, Logan. All right, well, we do have one question so far. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q and A and I will read them. Um, can anyone buy from Heritage or do you need to be a dealer? Yes, you can buy from Heritage. Let me actually show you this real quickly. So anyone can buy from Heritage if they want to um, via their online auctions or they often actually host them um, at shows. Uh, I know, uh, Logan, you're involved with shows, so you probably have some maybe overlap with that here. But uh, if you just create a Heritage um, uh, account, in effect, um, you will uh, can then basically go into their auction uh, platform like you see here. Um, and basically choose any of their departments. They have a bunch of different stuff they sell. Um, if we go to their main page here, here's an auction that's happening in 22 hours and anyone can bid just with that account and then they register your credit card information. Um, so it really does work out uh, quite nicely. Anyone can be involved with that. Cool, um, next one. Have you ever used internet image searches? Yes, yes. Uh, internet image searches uh, can be useful. I, I, there's different. There's a couple different ones. Um, so I, I, I don't know which one you're exactly referring to. But in terms of like uh, the images that uh, Peace Just and NGC use, um, like the, the True View, those are actually very useful. As are the Heritage Auctions and Stacks Bowers ones. A lot of organizations will take really nice, high quality photos that will allow you to kind of back. Uh, search uh, those coins and find more information. Uh, so if that works for you 100%, that's a great way to find information, especially if it's a piece that you really have no good starting points on. Um, uh, that happens with a lot of tokens. I don't really collect tokens myself, but I know a lot of token collectors who use like a to tokencatalog.org and they'll back search their tokens via image, um, especially if it's like a very unidentifiable token. All right, next one. Maybe I should say who this is because it um, is a personal question. Someone named Ross Johnson. I don't know if you're friends. Uh, does Kellen get teased for having a numismatic last name? Does he refer, refer to his collection as the Kellen Horde? I don't refer to it as the Kellen Horde. That's an excellent <laughs> idea. Um, I don't get teased for it. I actually get a lot of like appreciation for it, actually. Uh, people are like, that just works out very nicely. Um, yeah. and, it, and it does. 
uh, p- part of the uh, one problem I've run into is uh, my my numismatic oriented Instagram account, which is on social media. Uh, the username is Kellen Coin, and I've had people meet me in real life and think my last name is <laughs> Coin, and they'll be like, "That's like what a cool coincidence." I'm like, "Sorry, it's not. My last name's Horde." And like, "Oh, that still works out," and it does. Um, yeah. So I I don't get teased for it. I actually get I get praised for it, and I'm happy about that. Good, good. Uh, Kellen, what do you feel the future of the hobby will fare with younger per? How or I think it's how do you feel the future would of the hobby will fare with younger persons who are more used to high energy, high speed entertainment? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's kind of the question that everyone's minds all the time. Um, I think it will fare well, to be honest with you. Um, the the, the uh, um, young people who are interested in coins are going to be interested in coins, regardless of the internet. Um, it's, mo- it's mostly up to um, individual hobbyists and organizations to figure out how to meet young collectors where they're at, in my opinion. Um, earlier today, so I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with TikTok. Uh, it's a video app that like 500 million young people use, uh, and not even just young people, like of all ages. Um, and, and, uh, I, uh, across my page as I was scrolling came a coin TikTok, which I actually hadn't seen before. I was surprised by that. And the coin account, the account had 1.3 million followers wow. and they just talk about coins. And so you're meeting these young people where they're at and, and every, every video gets tens, if not hundreds of thousands of views. People are, when there's live streams, people are engaged and interested. So I really think when you meet young people where they're at, they are genuinely curious. Everyone mm-hmm. pat, uh, passed through coins. Um, I recently uh, looked at it and uh, the 2008 state quarters had 147 million Americans collecting them, mostly younger people. Um, and so as long as we're translating those younger people and bringing them more into the fold of the hobby, I really don't think you're going to have an issue. People touch coins very frequently. And 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 once you show that connection, um, there's also been a lot of news and headlines recently about really high expensive coin selling that tends to bring attention to the hobby as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's positive or negative, if people are like drawn away by like, oh, multi-million dollar prices. But either way, it does bring attention. So I'm really not worried about um, young people joining. The the key for me, I'm also not worried about young people leaving the hobby. I think once you get that initial engagement, and hopefully it's somewhat a level of engagement, um, my my ideal marker is you get them to come to summer seminar. I think once you get that, you're they're pretty much hooked for life. Um, but even if they leave, um, basically data seems to show that they come back in like their 30s. They'll like they'll kind of quit for college and uh, starting a family, but their 30s or 40s, or especially when their kids move out of the house in like 40s or 50s and they have some disposable income going on, um, that is when collectors really seem to come back in. So getting that initial hook in collectors is key. Um, and Abby Zachman, who uh, I think her talk was on that, uh, so you guys can go watch that. Um, but uh, really, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned about it. I don't th- and there's been concerns for decades about getting young collectors involved. So far, they have not borne fruit. Okay, next one. What is your favorite coin? Don't have a favorite coin. I, I, that'd be like picking a favorite child, but I'd probably be more inclined to pick a favorite child. Um, I, I don't, I don't have a favorite coin. Uh, I do uh, kind of like, uh, I just want to up there is the 43 steel cent um, just because it's a very unique piece and I love the story behind it. All right. Uh, does early American copper society deal with metals such as Libertas Americana? I don't know if you know the answer to that or not. Yeah. So um, early American copper society uh, deals with uh, half cents, large cents and some colonial pieces. Um, they don't uh, overlap with metals, but if you are interested in metals, um, join the Metal Collectors Association, the MCA. Um, and there's also the Token and Metal Society as well. Yes, yes. So th- those both work. Token Metal Society is a little bit more token oriented, but they do have both. Metal Collectors Association <clears throat> really is has basically the top scholars in the entire hobby. What tends to happen with numismatists as they go up in years, especially uh, numismatists who started like collecting U.S. federal coinage, they shift to like kind of the weird stuff. They get bored with the date mid-mark collection. They shift to kind of the weird stuff. And that tends to be metals because that has a lot of the cool history and stories and crazy context. And so you basically have about 20 of the top minds of the hobby leading the MCA who publish a, a really fantastic quarterly publication and who are weirdly accepting of the of questions and inquiries that you send to them. Um, so at the MCA for a young business is like $5 a year for an adult, it's like $35 a year, been totally worth it. Uh, and you'll find just such fantastic information. Awesome. Uh, is there a way to search for a particular currency notes sales history by using its serial number? There is. Um, I believe you can do that on the auction on both the auction websites um, by by serial number. I, I'm like 90 percent sure. Um, don't get upset at me if you can't because I don't know as much about paper money. Um, but but there's really quite a 
a lot of different ways, um, both online, at, just with search engines, with Google, um, and with auction company websites um, to, to search up paper money. And I imagine serial number is probably one of them.